film realist podcast the film and tv podcast from a complete nobody that's hopefully for somebody i am your host kyle naranya here for another episode which will have two major segments ones that i'm looking forward to doing um one will be a tier ranking list of all of the fast and furious films leading up to fast x which will be the review for next week's episode and ending the episode off with a review of The Mandalorian Season 3. That will be entirely full of spoilers. The show has completed Season 3. All eight episodes are now available on Disney+. Plus. If you have not yet had a chance to watch it, I put out the poll. These were the results, so you are getting a Season 3 review from me. Time codes will be listed in the description if you do want to jump around or if you just want to listen to it straightforward that works for me let's get into the tier ranking of some fast and some furious films the first of these fast and furious films is fast and the furious nope there's two thes in there it's the fast and the furious the first film that started this whole thing i don't think anyone would have believed we would have had 11 films in this franchise If you'd ask them then, and it's crazy to still think about it now, the first film is Point Break with Cars, and it works to the exact extent it was attempting to. It is a B-movie with some compelling characters that we did continue to move forward with. Some we haven't, some showed up much later in the franchise, and for that, I'm going to give it a B. I don't think it's any better than that. It knows what it is, and it succeeds in that goal. The next film, unfortunately, is not successful in... Anything outside of characters we eventually did bring back to the franchise, Too Fast and Too Furious introduces Roman Pierce, it introduces Tej, and outside of that, it's cool to have a movie where Brian is the lead and doesn't have Dom as his foil to some degree. We do get to see some of the aftermath of The Fast and The Furious, but the villain is is not good. The driving is more ridiculous than the first film, and I just, I don't even find it entertaining. It's very silly, and it's kind of dumb, which is funny, judging that I'm ranking all of the Fast and Furious films, but for that, I put an F. I think it's a failure. I think it fails to succeed where the first one did succeed. The next film is Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift, which was the first film directed by Justin Lin. It introduced Han to the universe and some other supporting characters that we did eventually see in F9 the fast saga the driving is the coolest part about this film the drifting that they did practically is amazing and really fun to watch outside of that it lacks the same or has the same problems that i think too fast and too furious has outside of han who is a character that was so compelling they did bring him back from the dead quite literally multiple times if you include the amount of times later on in the franchise that they pushed him going to tokyo And for that, it's a C. It fails to succeed where the first one did. And it's better than two because the driving is much cooler. And Han is is an awesome character and one of my personal favorites. Fast and Furious dropping the thes marked the unbelievable return, I guess, at the time of Brian and Dom coming back to the franchise. What I like most about the film is that it works as almost a remake of The Fast and The Furious. While the plot is simpler to a degree, becoming drivers for a drug cartel, it introduced a couple characters who would be very important to the franchise. Killing Letty at that time was a big deal and introducing, like I said, Gal Gadot's character who would become very important moving on for the next couple films. I think it works really well on its own and is a great follow-up to the three films we had had prior. So with that, I'm going to also put it in B... I enjoy this film a lot. It's one of my personal favorites leading into the next film, which was the start, in my opinion, of the insanity that this franchise can do successfully while also successfully use that word a lot earnestly talking about the family dynamic of the whole universe, the craziness that is this franchise bringing in a crew that we had seen throughout all of the different films. Tej is Tej Tej. Tej is back, Roman is back, Gal Gadot is back, Han is back because he had a cameo in Fast and Furious, and bringing all of these people together, leading to Brian becoming a father, I feel that this has the best personal scenes, 
And the relationships really do feel that they've developed throughout at this point what had been a decade. It is my favorite of the franchise and it is the best the franchise has ever been. Fast Five is an S tier film. It's phenomenal. It's if I have to recommend any of these and you still haven't seen one, I would recommend five every single day of the week. It's the one I go back to the most. Following that was Fast and Furious, a film that continued this large crew as the family has now become the staple. It has a compelling villain with Owen Shaw. I really like the fact that it's almost a team against the negative family or the anti-family where everybody has a an opposite twin, an evil twin. And it also has a character who would an actor anyways, who two of them, I believe one who is a, is a cast member and one who is a stunt double. And both of them would wind up in warrior show. If you're a fan of this podcast, you know, I'm very much looking forward to, which comes out at the end of next month, not an ad, just really like that show and would really appreciate if more people watched it. I really like fast and furious six or furious six. Justin Lin took a break from the franchise after this film and it did solidify where Tokyo Drift does happen in the timeline. It's really entertaining. I think it maintains the excitement and the stunts and the action of Fast Five. While not as successful, I think it works really, really well. And for that, I'm going to put it in the category of A. Furious 7, everyone knows the tragedy that happened while this film was in production with the death of Paul Walker. James Wan came into the franchise and was given a monumental task to salvage a film that the rest of the cast wanted to make. They felt that that was what Paul Walker would have wanted. And outside of some bumps along the road, metaphorically in the film's construction, I do think the film works well. It is a loving and emotional tribute to an actor and to a character that people grew to love. And it's a film that I get emotional about. And if with a franchise as ridiculous as this to successfully retire a character with a heartfelt goodbye with a song that will continue to make me emotional outside. And it brings in the first revenge story we had seen in the franchise with Deckard Shaw being played by Jason Statham, who became a staple of the franchise afterwards. I think it also belongs in the category of a, the Fate and the Furious, the eighth film, should have been F8 of the Furious if we're doing letter or number puns, which we would get to later. It suffers from not having Brian in the film. Obviously, we understand why that is the case and becomes the first film to focus on Dom. It was the film that broke up Brian or um, Hobbs and The Rock. I guess I didn't mention The Rock in five, but he was a he's a great addition to this universe. And these characters start to be a part because the actors did not want to work with each other. It put Deckard Shaw and Hobbs in more scenes together. And that established a chemistry that eventually would lead to something else. It is even more insane than six and seven. And I think it's fun. It changes a massive thing about Dom's character and his relationship with Elena. But I, it's the first misstep post Fast Four or Fast and Furious, which is unfortunate. So with that, I'm going to put it in the category of C because there is some fun stuff in it. But outside of that, it's not great. And that's unfortunate. The next one is sorry, not C, D. It goes in D. The next film is Hobbs and Shaw, the second spinoff that really drove a wedge between The Rock and the other fast, the mainline Fast and Furious films, which had Idris Elba, obviously Deckard Shaw and Luke Hobbs were characters that people really enjoyed together in Fate of the First, which is one of the best things it gives. Their chemistry back and forth is awesome, and it becomes more abundantly clear that that's something that's missing between Hobbs and Dom and Brian and Dom in the other films. I think it's a lot of fun. It's insane from the other films, but because it's has two leads and that is the focus. I think it's better than fate of the furious. So I would put that one in C. The last film we have left here for the tier list is F nine. It again writes around Brian O'Connor, not being in the films. It introduces Jacob Toretto, a character who was played by John Cena, who 
I have no problem with. I think he fits well in this franchise with what they are doing with the insanity and the craziness. They went to space. They brought back Han in a really silly way, in my opinion. I don't think the fan demand for Han to be back in the universe was met with as thought out writing. And I know these films are insane and ridiculous, but that's something that I don't think they should have fumbled the way that they did. The action is crazy and it's entertaining, but it suffers from the same issues I have with Fate of the Furious, which is, it's ironically, it's missing that heart. They wrote something interesting with Jacob and why we've never heard of him. Mia does come back into the fold and the universe is continuing to expand as well as with Mr. Nobody, who I didn't mention in 7 and 8, but he is there. And it may have threads that pull into 10. Who knows? 10 from all the trailers. I still have no idea what's happening. Outside of that, it's it's fine. But if I had to rank it with the rest of these, it's also a D. That's unfortunate, and I wish it was better. I'm hoping 10 is better, but that's where I rank all of the Fast and Furious films we've had so far. I'm going to go from top to bottom. In the S tier list, I have A. In A tier list, sorry, in S tier, I have Fast Five. In A tier, I have Furious Six and Furious Seven. In B tier, I have The Fast and The Furious and Fast and Furious. In C tier, I have Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift, in as well as Fast and Furious Presents Hobbs and Shaw. In D list, I have The Fate of the Furious and F9, The Fast Saga. And F tier, I have Too Fast and Too Furious. That will wrap up my tier ranking list. Let's get into the latest Star Wars season of The Mandalorian. All right, The Mandalorian season three. Bunch of different directors, mostly written by Jon Favreau. Dave Filoni, I'm not exactly sure how much involvement he had with the show. It looks like very little outside of two episodes, chapter four, or sorry, chapter 20 and chapter 23 had Dave Filoni and everything else written by Jon Favreau. It seems like Dave Filoni was over making Ahsoka. So if you're curious why there was a delay, I'm going to be honest, the first couple episodes into the season, I didn't really enjoy. It did feel like season three of a show where... We're doing some catch up. We're doing some very silly things. And I understand that Star Wars is in in its essence a very silly show. But I really loved the first season of the show being very Western in its aesthetic and style. And two, obviously expanded the universe. And some people argue that it was a significantly backdoor pilot season. Being a fan of Ahsoka and that aspect of the Star Wars universe, I really enjoyed that aspect. And it's unfortunate that that's how some view it. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. This season is kind of a season of a bunch of different stories. And The Mandalorian, mostly not the focus, which I don't have an issue with. But that's in the show's pitch, not why I watch it. Bo-Katan is a good character. Spent several seasons with her in Star Wars The Clone Wars. Having this all be about Mandalore, I think at the end of the day did work for the show. Again, I said this at the beginning of the show, this is going to be full spoilers. The show has been, uh, the season has almost been done for about a month now at date of recording. We get some ridiculous stuff with IG 11, some fetch quest stuff. And then we get a really interesting episode that feels like it was written off of the back of the Mandalorian. There's more focus on the relationship between Grogu and Jin Din Djarin, which I really like. We don't get to see his face at all in this, which is leads to how his connection is with his The Way Mandalorian crew. Obviously different than Bo-Katan's way of living as Mandalorians. And we do get to see those groups going back and forth with each other. What I found most interesting about this season is how the back three episodes do work really well in telling a cohesive story. But up until that point, it's parts of the story that seem disjointed and eventually are connected by the time you get to the end of it, which I appreciated. One of the things that I am enjoying less and less with Star Wars, specifically on Disney Plus, is actors who just want to be a part of it, who are not getting lost in character, 
One of the aspects of Bill Burr's character that I love so much is Bill Burr does not give anything. He does not give a single care about Star Wars. It was interesting for him to be a part of it. And yes, you could argue he's just being Bill Burr, but he's not the distraction of the episode. And what I would argue is that what I enjoyed most about his appearance in the show is his conflict with Din Djarin in that episode is vital and we really get to understand more about the quote unquote Mandalorian and what he's willing to do for Grogu with in, in lifting his helmet up so he can be scanned by the machine. I guess I should have said that this is going to be spoilers for all three seasons, but we're in season three. I'm assuming you're you're with me here at this point. And if you're not, I'm sorry to hear that. And so the episode with <laughs> Lizzo and Jack Black they don't disappear into character. Jack Black, who I absolutely love, and this is not a shot at Jack Black, I really would have appreciated more if he did disappear into character. I think Jack Black is amazing and he's fun, but to some degree, one of the things I loved most about him being Bowser's, I didn't have to see him. He's doing a crazy voice, which sounds different enough from Poe, and they are very different characters. One is a spiked turtle who wants to take over the world, and the other is a a shy panda who wants nothing more than to learn Kung Fu and be looked at evenly amongst his idols. I thoroughly enjoyed all three Kung Fu Panda movies, Kung Fu Panda movies, if you're curious. And so I liked the elements of having a second with Bo-Katan and the Mandalorian. And we get to see in ex the how this series is continuing to push time forward, leading up to something like the force awakens, where we do get to see general Hux's father, rem a reminder that this is 35 years before force awakens and certain elements need to be pushed forward. Cloning is continuing to get tested. That leads to something that has to do with Snoke as well as the use of the Mandalorian best scar medals. I think Moff Gideon just kind of shows up out of nowhere. I really would have appreciated an inference that he was still doing things throughout the show. I don't know if that led to was because of, oh my goodness, Giancarlo Esposito's availability. We obviously get teases of certain elements. An example with the Beskar armor. We do get to see Mr. Kim show up again. And that detail is really interesting, but we don't get to see the his investigation lead to are the Mandalorians involved? We get Beskar being teased, but the use of it's just told to us there was no twist behind the use of it. I guess if you're assuming it's the Mandalorians, it doesn't lead you to believe that we just get to see a bunch of rogue MP or I guess fragmented Imperials using Beskar armor that does connect ironically to Rise of Skywalker, where we see stormtroopers with jetpacks. I think the action in chapters 23 and 24 is very good. I really did like those two episodes the most of the whole season. This is not a shot at the individual at all. I'm only judging this based on the quality of the show. I finished chapter 22 and I was really curious who directed it because I did not enjoy that episode and it happened to be Bryce Dallas Howard. I find it very interesting that the, without even knowing all of the episodes she directed are the ones I like the least. I think that it may be due to the fact that she's getting the worst scripts and she's doing the best she can with them, or both are the same. I'm not a fan of her directorial style. Again, as a human being, I'm sure she's a lovely person. People continually want to work with her, but in Star Wars, it's ironic to me that anything the Howards have directed, I have not thoroughly enjoyed, including her father, Ron, and Solo, A Star Wars Story. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that trend gets destroyed for season four. Season four is in development. Who knows when we get it? I am shocked to say this, but as somebody who does like to watch something week to week, I enjoyed this season much more in binge watching nature, which is funny because previous seasons I enjoyed significantly more week to week. And I'm curious if the reason for that is with Dave Filoni being involved less with the show that Jon Favreau did write it as a big chunk. Dave Filoni did cut his teeth with weekly television all the way back to Avatar, The Last Airbender, obviously Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and Rebels were all done in a weekly fashion where each episode needs to be really great so that way you want to watch next week. Binge culture, you don't necessarily need to if you were watching that all in one sitting. 
that's just my personal opinion on the two different watching styles. Typically, again, I like to watch things in week to week fashion because it gives me time. I had forgotten what happened in episodes one, two and three, even though I knew I didn't really enjoy them. So I watched essentially, I guess, four hours and four hours and that I liked. I enjoyed the season as a whole. I was just hoping for something more. And one of the aspects of it that I did not like was it felt like more. One thing I haven't brought up yet is there is a tease of Thrawn. Obviously, we know he's going to be in Ahsoka, and I'm assuming based on everything I know about Thrawn, having watched Rebels and read the newer Thrawn books, is that he is going to be the big bad of this post Return of the Jedi universe leading into likely the Mandalorian shared universe movie we are going to get. So fingers crossed that that's the case. I was really hoping for a cameo once his name popped up, but it would make sense if he shows up for the first time in Ahsoka because Lars Mikkelsen is in that show. So as a whole, I think it's fine. That's it. It's fine. It's more Mandalorian. If that's all you're looking for, this certainly should scrap, scratch that appetite. I was hoping for more given how much I enjoyed the first two seasons. Fingers crossed that they make a better season, quite frankly, for season four. I that's all I really have to say about it. It's unfortunate that that's the case. I don't want to feel this way about it. I did like it more than I suspected I would when I did watch the back half of it, which I enjoyed much more than the first half. If you really liked it, I'm glad for you. I'm hoping that we get something more akin to Andor, maybe with season four, something with serious stakes out of the two shows that we've that I've watched recently from the Star Wars universe. Bad Batch is the one that I enjoyed the most. I think the emotional stakes were higher and ultimately, I thought it told a more compelling story. So that'll wrap up my Mandalorian thoughts. Let me know what you thought about it on Twitter. You can tweet at me at Kyle Scornaranya or at Film Realists. That will wrap up the show. As stated at the beginning, you can look forward to a Fast X film review in next week's episode. The I always forget to do this, but the theme song for the podcast was performed and written by the band You Versus Me. You can find their music on Apple and Spotify. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please share with a friend who likes one guy rambling on about his opinion. Um, share the tweets. Help the show grow. I love the fans. You know who you are. I respond to questions on Twitter, and sometimes they make it into the episode if you want a longer answer. Please share with me your Fast and Furious rankings. If you enjoyed this ranking, I'm probably going to do a couple more leading into the summer. If you like the show a ton, please give it a five-star review. It helps with the analytics. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope to see you on the next one.